Today I'm going to give you a crash course of economics and this will be helpful for you if you're a trader or investor who know nothing about economics and you want to use it for your trading and investing. So the agenda for today is before we go into this, I need your full attention and also notebook and pen and paper and as I go along make sure you write everything down and the important points down so what I'm going to talk about today is components of fundamental analysis so economics is part of fundamental analysis second thing economic principles terms you need to know just like in trading investing there are things like margin leverage all this lingo in the world of economics there are also lingo that you need to know then I'm going to go into economic indicators, how the business cycles affect these indicators. And then currency regimes, very important because you need to know which currencies to pick based on their regime. If you pick the wrong kind of regime, no matter what you do, you are not going to make money. How to analyze economic indicators the right way. So if you're learning something like fundamental analysis, there are a lot of components to it and all of these, they are not mutually exclusive, they can be under the same category. But some of the components you need to learn is example, capital flow. Is capital flowing into or out of the country? If capital is flowing into a country, it means that investors are optimistic about the economic prospects of that country. The next thing you need to know is you need to understand how international trade works. Balance of payment. When a country has a trade surplus, generally it is good for the economy. When a country has a trade deficit, provided that all the factors remain the same, it is bad for the country. And of course, the other thing you need to learn economic indicators, which is what I'm going to cover later on. And if you're a stock investor, fundamental analysis means something else completely different, and that is financial statement. As a stock investor, you also need to look at the big picture. If you study finance in school, you'll come across this term called PESTEL, P-E-S-T-E-L. Political, economic factors, societal factors, technological factors, environmental factors, and legal factors. Because no matter how good the company is, if the country in which they are residing at suck shit, then nothing is going to change. The next thing you need to learn, intermarket analysis. Now some people would say that, okay, this is not really under fundamental analysis. You need to look at central bank policies. And all of this, you can sort of categorize it under one big umbrella, and that is macroeconomics. So if you study economics in school, Economics is divided into two types. First one, microeconomics. Second one, macroeconomics. So microeconomics, you are studying the decisions made by individuals, businesses. This means that you're looking at the smaller picture. Okay? But if you are looking at macroeconomics, you are looking at the big picture. Okay? The keyword, macro. And macro is something you need to study if you want to become a successful long-term trend follower. So for macroeconomics, you're studying the overall economy of a country, of a nation. For microeconomics, you're looking at whether an individual, are they earning more, are they earning less? And there are three main areas that economists focus on and also the Fed focus on. The first one is inflation or deflation. And then you have economic growth or productivity. You also have one of the most important thing and that is employment. One of the things that affect inflation deflation is the amount of money supply. This will affect inflation and deflation. I think I should move this up. The amount of people employed in the country is going to affect the national income. Productivity of workers is going to affect economic growth because the same amount of workers, they can produce more without increasing their working hours, without working overtime. So even if you're not a trader investor, you realize that these things affect you. In 20 years ago, a cup of coffee is... 20 years ago, I don't drink coffee, so... Movie ticket is 
I don't really pay for the movie ticket. 20 years ago, movie tickets are cheaper. 20 years later, right now, it's a lot more expensive because of inflation. Politicians, if you don't understand macroeconomics, you wouldn't be able to differentiate between a good policy with a bad policy. There are some lingo you need to know. The first thing that you'll come across is this scar city. It basically just tells you that human needs are infinite. Doesn't matter how rich you are, when you have a yacht, private jet, Lamborghini, and you got sick of these things, you'll be like, maybe the next thing I need is a spaceship. The next term you come across, you pronounce. This basically tells you that while that certain variable change, all the other factors remain the same. Example, if we run a shop today that sells hot chocolate, after running our shop for one year, we are still broke as shit. So we decide to increase our prices. We know that when we increase our prices, demand for our hot chocolate is going to decrease, provided that everything remains the same. Because if we take into account other things like people's income level, like they are getting richer or winter is coming, it's going to affect our hot chocolate sales. You'll come across this term called consensus. What does this mean? Every single month, economists, they are going to publish their forecasts. So basically, it is the forecast of what the economic numbers is going to turn out to be. And it's not about the absolute number that matters. It's not about, okay, if the number comes up positive, then the currency or the stock is going to go up. It's not about absolute number, it's about expectations and percentage change. So if the expectations is very different from reality, meaning the actual results that come out, then it's going to move the markets a lot. But if expectations is in line with reality, then the markets wouldn't move that much. Opportunity costs. You might already know this. So if you choose to buy a book today, what's your opportunity cost? You could use that money for a staycation. So the next term you need to know is nominal values versus real values an economic indicator like gdp you have nominal gdp and also you have real gdp i'm going to talk more about this later on the next big macroeconomics concept is law of demand and supply now if you're talking about product services in general if you plot a graph of price versus quantity as you already know when the price of let's say movie tickets increases the quantity demanded will decrease and hence this would give you the demand curve when the price of something increases suppliers they are going to produce more so that they can sell more stuff the higher the price the more suppliers are going to produce more and hence the increase in supply and right here will be the equilibrium level and this is assuming that everything else remains the same but what if one external factor change for example if the amount of money you earn every single month if people's income increase the demand is going to increase so the curve is going to shift to the right and your new curve would look like this if people's income decrease during a recession the curve is going to shift to the left okay the demand curve and if you change all this into the context of currencies how does it work so for example if singapore exports more to the united states what's going to happen is that u.s importers they are going to exchange usd to sgd and hence this is going to increase the demand for singapore dollars and hence it's going to shift the curve to the right sgd is going to appreciate it's going to go up supply of us dollars is going to increase and hence us dollar is going to go down depreciate so what if right now singapore wants to buy more from the united states so it's a different story altogether what's going to happen is that the supply of singapore dollar is going to increase and hence the curve is going to shift to the right side singapore dollar is going to depreciate and this increases the demand for usd and hence 
dollar is going to increase. So to put things into simple terms, when the demand for a currency increases, the price is going to go up. When the supply of a currency increases, the price is going to go down. So there are a lot of economic indicators out there. Some are very important, some are completely useless, but you need to go back to the three main macroeconomic themes that I talked about just now, which is productivity, economic growth, inflation, and employment. So first thing first, you need to understand what a perfect economy is like. Because everybody wants to have a perfect economy. You and I, central banks, politicians, what is a perfect economy like? Everybody has jobs. Second thing, inflation. People want prices to not fluctuate too much to be stable. Of course, people want high economic growth because generally it is good for businesses, good for you as an employee if you are in a 9 to 5 job. Does a perfect economy exist? No, because different countries, they have different flaws. They might have deflation year after year after year, but they provide jobs to people. Now, there are a lot of reports, surveys, statistics that measure some of these economic factors. I'm not going to go into detail regarding that. I'm going to reserve that for future videos, provided that everything remains the same, remains constant. The more people are employed, the better it is for the economy. And hence, the better it is for the currency. Now, when it comes to inflation, having inflation is actually normal. It can be a good thing or bad thing because, example, if you lend money to people, an increase in inflation is going to harm you because when the borrowers return the money back to you, it is less than before. So in general, when a country is experiencing inflation, we would look to short the currency. But if the inflation rate increases by too much, way beyond normal levels, you would need to look for a long trade instead because Fed is going to do something about it. They are going to increase interest rates. When there's deflation, you would want to look to buy the currency. But if it decreases by too much, then you would want to take the opposite trade, which is short. Again, Fed is going to do something about it. They are going to cut rates. And when it comes to inflation, a very common way to measure inflation is CPI and PPI. Again, I'm going to talk about this in detail in the future videos. When everything else is constant, an increase in economic growth is going to be good for the currency. And hence, the currency is going to appreciate. Again, provided that everything remains constant. And particularly, you need to look at real GDP because it is adjusted for inflation. So when real GDP is very low, it is bad for the economy, people will lose their jobs and hence the currency is going to depreciate. Very important thing is not the absolute value that matters. It is the expectations and percentage change of real GDP that matters. Because for example, this month, if real GDP is super negative, but next month it is still negative, but less negative than before, guess what? The currency is going to go up. So the next thing you need to learn is business cycles. In other words, economic fluctuations. Now, why is this so important is because if you are a forex trader, a phase of high economic growth, people are going to focus on inflation. Whereas during a recession, people are not going to focus that much on inflation rate. So you need to understand that different business cycles, people are going to focus on different economic indicators and hence it's going to impact the movement of currencies. There are four main phases of the business cycle. And if you're a stock investor, you also need to know this because during a recession, defensive stocks is going to go up. During an economic growth phase, cyclical stocks are going to do well. So if you are to plot a graph for business cycle, you would have real GDP on the y-axis and then you have time on the x-axis. So the four phases look something like this. Economic growth, then followed by a peak 
All right. After that will be followed by a recession. And of course, with any recession, bad times is going to end. Then it would have a bottom. When the bottom has been reached, the economy is going to start to recover. And hence, you would go back to the growth phase. And the cycle repeats itself again and again and again. So during this economic growth phase, it is the expansion phase. So when the economy is expanding, people have jobs, businesses are doing well. And of course, when it reaches the end of an expansion phase, you would have a peak. So during the expansion phase, you would have inflation. And when inflation reaches way beyond normal levels, what's going to happen is that central banks are going to increase interest rates can be also caused by housing market bubble example in 2008 tons of people they default on their subprime mortgages can be also due to the stupid coronavirus so when fed increases interest rate people are going to struggle to get car loans mortgages and hence less people are able to afford goods and services and during the start of the economic downturn you will see things like bond prices going up yields going down and then people are going to start to lose their jobs which they think is very stable stock market will start to plunge but you will see defensive stocks starting to do well and this is what we call a recession and if you compare these two cycles recession and expansion the good news is that recession over the past many years history lasts an average of 11 months and how do you define recession two consecutive quarters of negative gdp growth expansion on average lasts for 59 months if you want to become part of the smart money you need to know that recession doesn't last that long and when a recession comes you gotta be prepared to spot opportunities and during the recession especially when it's very near the bottom you see things like cutting of interest rates, tax cuts, increase in federal spending. So all of these factors are going to help with the recovery. But if all else fails, then we would have things like money printing. So of course, with any economic cycle, there's going to be a bottom. When the news say we are in a recession right now, of course, anybody can tell that it is a recession. But how about when you're in a recovery or expansion phase? but you don't know when a recession is going to come. So one of the clues that you can look at is if long-term bond yields is lower than short-term bond yields, which gives you an inverted yield curve, then it is an early sign that a recession is going to come soon. How do you know when the bottom is reached? People are bargain hunting for houses, property, then that is one of the early signs that okay an economic recovery is going to come soon and during the start of the expansion phase you have the recovery phase and you will observe a couple of things bond prices are going to fall yields are going to go up and commodities are going to go up cyclical stocks are also going to start making a u-turn and if you bought during a recession the good stocks you would earn money during the recovery if you're talking about currencies during an expansion phase the high yield currencies are going to go up are going to do well during a recession low yield currencies are going to do well because investors they are putting their capital into safe havens which is low yield currencies so when times are good you can buy high yield currencies when times are bad you can buy low yield currencies short sell high yield currencies pair a high yield currency with a low yield currency you have a trade you need to understand currency regimes because if you pick and trade currency pairs that has a fixed regime you'll be wondering why is the currency not moving and every single day you're just paying swaps to your broker making your broker rich you don't want that right so Example of fixed regime currencies, you have Singapore dollar and also Hong Kong dollar. Singapore dollar is pegged to a basket of currencies which are not disclosed. Why is it that countries want to 
peg their currencies at a certain fixed rate because it provides importers, exporters and also investors confidence. The currency is not going to move that much, it's not going to fluctuate that much. So this provides them a certain level of certainty. So a fixed regime currency works like this. You have an upper limit where the currency can fluctuate to and a lower limit. If the currency value goes beyond the upper limit, becomes overvalued. Central banks are going to sell the currency so that it comes back down to the normal levels using foreign reserves. At the same time, if it goes below the lower limit, central banks are going to buy the currency and hence it's going to go back up to the normal levels. So when the currency is packed to a currency or a basket of currencies, it's not going to fluctuate that much. The bad thing about fixed regime is that it's very hard to maintain it. It's very costly for central banks to maintain the currency value. And also sometimes it might cause a financial crisis. For example, Asian financial crisis. As a forex trader, what you want to trade are the floating currencies, the currencies that move. Floating regimes, they are going to move due to market forces. For example, if there's a trade surplus, is going to self-correct based on that. So what happens if a country has a trade surplus? Which means that the country exports more than it imports. Provided that everything else remains the same, this is good for the currency and hence the currency is going to appreciate. So what happens when the currency appreciates? Exports become more expensive. Agree with me? And at the same time, imports become cheaper demand for imports is going to increase. These two factors then cause the trade surplus to decrease. And hence, balance of payments will go back to the equilibrium level. So this is how the currency will adjust itself. For trade deficit, it's the other way around. Trade deficit, bad for the currency. Currency is going to go down. Exports become cheaper. Demand for exports is going to increase. This will increase the trade surplus and hence balance of payment go back to normal. You realize that it is bad for exporters and importers because the currency fluctuates. It's very uncertain as compared to a currency with a fixed regime. But of course, if the currency increases way beyond normal levels, central banks are not going to like it. They are going to intervene. Currencies with floating regimes, central banks are going to intervene. How about fixed regimes? Again, central banks are going to intervene. Just that in a fixed regime, they are going to intervene more as compared to a currency with a floating regime. Either way, central banks are going to do something. If you think about this, no currency is entirely floating, free floating. No currency is entirely fixed because either way central banks are going to intervene so you can say that currencies are actually called managed floats so which are the currencies that have a floating regime look at the major currencies dollar yen pound the currencies that most people trade so how do you analyze economic indicators properly? Of course, a lot of people, retail traders, they look at things like economic indicators on Forex Factory. My voice is already gone. Forex Factory or some other platforms. But it's not about where you look at the data, but it's about how you analyze it. First thing first, like what I said just now, it is the percentage change that matters most, not the absolute number. Also, expectations are very important. Another thing is that don't just look at one month's worth of data because you know why? Sample size is too small. If you study statistics, this is not enough of a sample size. Because you know why? If you look at just one month or two months, what happens if that one month, there's a special occasion like Christmas and then you look at Oh my god, consumer spending increased by so much. Minimum look at past 3 to 6 months. If you want to look at past 6 months inflation data, you take all the numbers, divide by 6, then you get a better average number. If you're looking at technical analysis, you have moving average, right? So this is like taking the moving average of the economic data.
You need to understand the difference between leading economic indicators, okay? And this is what hedge fund managers look at that a lot of retail traders don't look at. And which one are the lagging economic indicators? The mistake that most retail traders make is that they make their trading decisions based on lagging indicators or coincident indicators which tells you what is happening right now not what is going to happen in the future so if you trade with technical analysis are you just going to look at the lagging indicators no right then why would you do that for economic indicators doesn't make sense in other words what is the real gdp six to twelve months from now look at this so when it comes to economic indicators there are lots of things to cover for this so i'm going to reserve this for the next course which is going to be published here on youtube so yeah just stay tuned for it in the meantime if you haven't went through the fundamental analysis course i have made you can go and check it out okay so with that i'll talk to you in the next video bye